All right. Well, welcome back, everybody. Um, <clears throat> so my name is Guillaume Book. I'm sorry, actually, I couldn't join yesterday. So uh, I'll, I'll use this opportunity to, to introduce myself a little bit. I believe you've already met uh, from my group, Hector and Maraike and, and David. Uh, so Hector and Maraike in particular will be helping me uh, with this module on, on whole genome bisulfite sequencing and analysis. Um, I've, I've seen parts of what Martin and Edmund uh, were, were showing, and obviously they've set the bar very high, so uh, hopefully uh, hopefully we'll do as good uh, as they did uh, in terms of introducing you with, um, you know, methylation analysis using uh, whole genome bisulfite sequencing. Um, <clears throat> so jumping right into it, um, the objectives of this particular module um, are really to, to, to know the different technologies that are used to measure DNA methylation. And as you'll see, uh, you know, we'll do a bit of a sort of a historical background in terms of how DNA methylation was measured, and then also talk about some of the, the, the newer technologies. Uh, we'll talk briefly about some of their strengths and weaknesses uh, of these different approaches. You'll see that, uh, yeah, it's still it's still in, in some case uh, a, a challenge to do the profiling of the whole genome and characterize the methylation status. Um, <clears throat> what we'll focus on, though, for both the, the presentation and also the lab is really, um, you know, the bisulfite sequencing data analysis workflow itself, uh, which is really a sort of um, the mostly used uh, approach here. Um, and then we'll, we'll sort of highlight some of the principle and challenges in those analysis. Uh, and then within the presentation, we'll, we'll provide sort of a high level overview of the workflows and the, the different analysis, but then you'll go much deeper into that uh, with, with Hector and Maraike in the, in the practical. So um, <clears throat> really feel free if you have uh, questions uh, along the way. To, to stop me. I don't see the Slack. I don't know how and then was set up. So I don't see the Slack. So uh, but please raise your hand or if anybody can can just stop me and, and ask questions that are on Slack. Uh, I'll be happy to to answer them. Um all right. So here we go. <clears throat> so what is DNA methylation? So I, I guess in the chip seek practical and in and, and lecture you were already talking about um different types of methylation. Here we're going to be focusing on DNA methylation and on, in particular on 5-methylcytosine uh, uh, methylation. Um, this, this particular type of methylation uh, affects between 70 and 80 percent of CPGs in the human genome. Um, <clears throat> high level of, of uh, 5-MC and, and CPG-rich promoter in particular are associated with repression. Uh, and in, there's still lots to be learned about what's happening outside of these uh, promoters and in CPG poor regions and understanding the relationship between the DNA methylation and transcription and lots of other processes, which is why having good assays to, to characterize this, uh, this methyl DNA methylation are, are, are really uh, useful and needed. Um, again, just a sort of a quick background to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Um, you know, within the, the chip seek analysis, what you guys were mostly looking at were uh, histone tail uh, modifications. Here we're really looking at the actual DNA itself and, and its methylation. Uh, and for most of the analysis, we're going to be focusing on uh, the cytosine methylation into methyl cytosine. Um, and, you know, one of the properties, you, you can have de novo methylation, but one thing that's uh, quite uh, specific to the DNA methylation is the met maintenance of methylation with uh, really uh, methylation that's added to the complement strand, uh, which is one of the, the unique feature uh, of DNA methylation is the fact that you have both de novo and, and maintenance, and especially the maintenance can be associated with interesting uh, processes, which is what I have on the next slide. Uh, <clears throat> you know, methylation is 
is known and has demonstrated role in, in the mitotic inheritance uh, through this mechanism of having uh, methylation on one strand that's then reproduced on, on the on, on the uh, complementary strand. So uh, DNA methylation has been shown to be important in genomic imprinting, uh, in the silencing of transposable element, stem cell differentiation, um, lots of development processes and, and distinguishing different cell types. Uh, again, there's there's a certain level of stability associated with the methylation marks once they're uh, put in place, and that really is um, means that in terms of um, cellular uh, development, uh, this is an important mark to characterize. It also has role in inflammation uh, and 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 in many other processes, in particular in cancer. And this is what I have on, on this slide. Um, you know, there's there's some uh, very well uh, known uh, patterns associated with uh, methylation in cancer. Uh, you've got some cartoon examples here at the top where you have, you know, a normal state where um, you have limited um, methylation in the promoter of a gene, which leads to uh, to, to to good transcription of that gene, while you have some methylation within the gene that actually promote, pre prevents alternative uh, aberrant uh, transcription start site to initiate. So this would be in a normal state, but then you can have what's shown below. I guess I could put up pointers on this. You guys know what I'm talking about. Um, or you can have the, the status in, in, at the bottom where, um, you know, aberrant methylation patterns um, which occur in a number of different ways, either just genetic uh, epigenetic deregulation or or specific uh, mutations in, in methylation pathways leading to, to ab aberrant methylation pattern where, for instance, you now have methylation over the normal promoter of the gene preventing its uh, normal expression and, and lack of methylation within the gene leading to, to alternative being expressed. So overall uh, control and, and, and correct deposition of methylation is, is quite important for, for normal processes and in some cases can be uh, deregulated in cancer. Um, at the bottom, you just have an example of um, the other thing that I mentioned, which is quite important for uh, methylation, which is the control of uh, transposable element uh, and, and preventing um, you know, ALU or L1 transposition in human, for instance. Um, so you have, again, at the norm, in the normal state, methylation over some of these repetitive or, or transposon sequences. So this is the expected uh, normal state. But then if you have displacement of that methylation, uh, then, then you might have genomic instability and, and, and transposition events that, are, that get reactivated. And so, you know, so in, in cancer in particular, there's there's lots uh, to be characterized in terms of methylation, in particular because there's some uh, not quite powerful uh, pharmaceutical agent that might actually also allow you to to try to revert uh, and, and and modify the, the state of the genome to the more normal state. Um, <clears throat> okay, but that's that was just a bit of of the motivation and, and what. Um, what are some of the, the interests in, in methylation? Uh, now, I'll, I'll quickly, as I mentioned, go over some of the, I guess, uh, traditional assays to, to profile uh, methylation and then move into some of the more, uh, the, 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 the latest uh, technologies. Um, <clears throat> one of the things before I go into this in more detail is that you'll see that uh, one, one thing that's in common with many of these approach is this uh, bisulfite treatment. So bisulfite that's used for, for microarray uh, and also for some of the whole genome bisulfite sequencing cells. Um, <clears throat> so just a couple of slides on, on this. Um, oops, I'm losing my... So, so the bisulfite treatment and bisulfite con conversion uh, the pi sulfite conversion actually 
has a different effect on on cytosine that are that are unmethylated versus methylated. Um, so you have okay, I have a weird thing showing up on my screen. Uh, so you have that the the, in the you know through the bisulfite um, conversion. Uh, the unmethylated cytosines are converted to uracils, while the methylated cytosines are protected from this treatment. And, and if you then have PCR amplification, uh, the net effect is that uh, the, the, the unmethylated cytosine will be converted to, to thiamine, and then the, 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 the methylated uh, cytosine will remain as a cytosine. Uh, so so using this trick, and if you then sequence these PCR amplified fragment, uh, you'll you'll have a way to to identify the the C that were methylated versus unmethylated uh, because of this uh, this this um, uh, distinguishing factor here. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated than this, and we'll get back to that when we talk about um, a bit more of the workflow to analyze. But one of the complication comes from the fact that you have the two strands, um, you have the two strands of DNA, and and the effect that the, um, this will have on the two strand uh, will appear a bit different in in the the processing, um, because um, like on the reverse strand, that C is a G. Well, but again, because it's it's uh, typically uh, the CPG or have methylations on both sides, but it's just uh, the the two strand will have to be uh, treated informatically differently uh, to to resolve these uh, C to T conversions uh, accurately. But again, we'll, we'll we'll get back to this with uh, a bit more uh, when we look at the analysis workflow. All right, so that was just uh, a bit on the on the bisulfite microarray treatment. Um, so one of the, the first uh, genome-wide approach to characterize uh, met DNA methylation was to use bisulfite microarrays. So you had the DNA preparation, the bisulfite conversion, and then a bit like what you would do using microarrays to do genotyping, you would actually hybridize uh, and you would have probes that represent CPG with and without the methylation, uh, and then you would be able to uh, characterize which which uh, which sites uh, are methylated, and then you do data normalization and analysis. Um, again, I'm I'm going quickly over this just to give you a, a bit of a taste of how what are the alternative approaches uh, to this. Um, one one of the challenge with um, the microarrays is that you know. You know, even with 450k or or some of the the, the larger uh, arrays now with on 150k uh, CPGs or features on them, you know, you can cover some of the genome, but maybe not all of the genome. So the the next slide, but if you have access to the slide, it's not a big uh, big surprise. But how many CPGs are in the human genome? For those who haven't looked ahead in, into the slide. Uh, to see what the answer is to that. Oops, so now I, I've showed it myself. I just tried to, uh, to, to go back and look at the, the Slack, but the answer is 26 million. So there's, um, there's really, um, you know, quite a lot of, of CPGs uh, in the genome, in the human genome. So if you're trying to profile uh, the CPGs in the human genome with microarrays, even if you have a million feature, you know your your coverage is going to be a bit sparse, and this is a sort of an old uh, slide showing uh, this. So just giving you a sense of that coverage, uh, you see over you know uh, uh, I'm not sure the, the size of this region. This is the Hox uh, a, a Hox cluster, but you see the density of all the CPGs in the genome. You see the locations of CPG island many of which associated with uh, promoters of some of these genes. Uh, and this is an older version of the array that only had 27,000 probes, but you can see that the probes were really uh, distributed uh, throughout. So even with, with the newer arrays, 
uh, you still have to make a selection and decisions about you know which CPGs um, or which actually sees uh, you're interested in, and so that that's a bit of a, uh, a limitation of the the arrays. Um, so so moving on to some of the other approaches, and these now are are actually closely linked to uh, some of the um, the work that you've been doing over the last uh, day and a half which are sort of enrichment based. Uh, so you can do, uh, this one doesn't even involve any uh, bisulfite treatment. Uh, you just, uh, you know, prepare the DNA and then you have an antibody that actually enriches directly for these uh, five uh, metal cytosines. So the cytosines that are uh, methylated. So you're doing basically very similar to a ChIP-seq experiment, except you have an antibody that's targeting uh, the five prime metal cytosine, and then and then you do the analysis. Like actually, a lot like um, you would do uh, the chip seek analysis as as you've shown. Um, one of, well, we'll get to the limitation, but one of the limitation with this is you'll get regions that are methylated, but you you don't have the same kind of base pair resolution of methylation as you do with uh, the bisulfite treatment. Um, so similar, uh, another enrichment-based approach uh, targeting, uh, and, and these are some of the, the main approaches. There's, of course, even more approaches, but this is just to give you uh, some, some examples, of the types of uh, approaches. So this is another approach that then enriches for a metal binding domain protein, uh, and, and then you would perform uh, similar library uh, preparation and sequencing and, and an analysis of enrichment in some regions of the genome with the presence of this uh, metal binding domain protein. Um, so the, the, the final example I'll give before moving on to the, the whole genome by sulfite sequencing approach, which is really um, the, 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 the main uh, technology that we'll be describing the analysis for in, in this module is the uh, RRBS uh, technology. So this <clears throat> uses a, a special uh, restriction enzyme that targets uh, these uh, CPGs. And so this will enrich for regions of CPGs in the library preparation. Uh, you'll perform bisulfite treatment and you'll do high throughput sequencing. And so this was, especially at a time where doing a whole genome by sulfide sequencing was still quite expensive, was a way, I guess, of, of, of bypassing sequencing the whole genome and really focusing the sequencing into um, CPGs and CPG island. Um, I'll, I'll get back to some of the challenges with this approach, but this is, again, a way of, of, of uh, uh, of doing uh, efficient sequencing around CPGs following bisulfite treatment. Um, again, this is uh, at this point a bit of an old slide, but just uh, showing that you know there's there's different approaches um, to some extent, quite a lot of uh, similarities of profile. So this is this is a good sign in the sense that um, you know just globally uh, you're you're getting consistent signal. But but each of these approaches has some some you know advantage and disadvantages. Some of them really have this base pair resolution of um, CPG methyl or uh, C methylation. Others are more enrichment based and give you these uh, these profiles of methylation. Um, yes, Marie. Uh, we have a question in the Slack from Mathieu. Yeah. Uh, he asks, uh, does the fact that methylated DNA precipitation uses an antibody-based approach means that we should use a CHIP-seq-like pipeline if we're coming across these kinds of data? Yes, that's that's correct. So, um, so you would be uh, using a CHIP-seq type of, of approach and then detecting peaks and regions of enrichment, but not, not specific methylations at the, at the seeds. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. 
Um, and this is um, just, again, sort of showing uh, some, some differences in terms of regions and coverage um, based on these and some of these older technology. But I, I really want to spend a bit more time talking about some of the, the latest technologies um, that in some ways, one of the big challenge with some of these enrichment based or RRBS uh, technologies was a bit like the question that was just asked, you know, the, the, the types of analysis that you would do, the types of normalization. In the case of RRBS in particular, uh, I think some aspects of the normalization were quite challenging because of this special targeting of the, the cutting enzyme in this case. Um, Bisulfite, in contrast to all of this, whole genome bisulfite sequencing has the advantage of really giving you an overview of the, of the whole genome. Um, you, you, you know, you do have the bisulfite treatment, but you don't have further enrichment in some of the region to, to draw, and you will be from this then getting, uh, you know, a base level estimate of, of methylation. So you don't need to make a priori selection of which region you're going to characterize, you're really going to be profiling the whole genome. So many advantages in, in, in this context. The, the, the main drawback at this stage remains the, the cost, because of course that means you do need to, to cover the whole genome with, uh, with short reads um, typically. And so that, that adds to, to the cost. But there's definitely at least uh, you bypass some of these challenges of selecting the regions you're going to profile. Um, just a, a slight small twist on this technology, which is a bit like you can do whole genome sequencing and you can do exome sequencing. So you can design, again, if you do want to scale up this technology to lots of sample, you could add uh, a capture of DNA regions at the end before you do the sequencing. Uh, so this would be another approach to sort of do mostly whole genome bisulfite, but do some kind of selection of the of regions uh, to enrich for, and this would allow you to lower the cost of sequencing and perhaps do more sample. Uh, so this is sort of a, a twist on the whole genome bisulfite sequencing approach. Um, there's some some very nice packages that, that allow you to, we're not gonna be using this in particular, but that allows you to, to analyze uh, data sets uh, from from mar microarrays and and, um, <clears throat> and 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 some of these other technologies I just talked about. Again, the nice thing is that from this and from these analyses, you see that at a high level, um, you know the sam the, at the global level, the samples behave similarly no matter which uh, technology is used, whether it's the 450k array or the the epic array or a whole genome bisulfite, but you know, globally, it's quite similar, but of course, you might be interested in, in specific regions that might not be covered uh, by the array. And so that that would be the benefit of uh, holding on by sulfide sequencing. Um, in terms of, I've, I've, I think I've said this already a little bit, but some of the, the you know, the advantages and disadvantages, uh, they, so they all provide you with, with um, you know, overall accurate DNA methylation measurements. Microarrays typically have lower cost, uh, but force you to to identify the regions. Um, the the enrichment based methods typically have slightly lower resolutions. Again, you'll get regions, you won't get base pair resolution, and be a bit of a challenge to normalize between uh, different experiments. Um, the advantage of the RRBS, MCC, and whole genome bisulfite is really you get base pair resolution, but uh, whole genome bisulfite remains expensive. Um, so, so before we and but but this still you know remains whole genome bisulfite sort of state of the art of what how to do this type of profiling in in in, uh, in large genome now. So that's really what we're going to be focusing on in the practical, but I, I wanted to give you also a taste of, of some of the new technologies and, and what's coming uh, in terms of uh, methylation profiling. Uh, and it's I think it's quite exciting that, you know, I'm sure you've heard about the long read technologies and the long read technologies not only allow 
assembly and, 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 and you know, variant characterization in difficult regions of the genome, they also, in, in, in many cases, allow you to look at um, <clears throat> both DNA and RNA uh, modifications, actually. So um, just very quickly, on the left side, you have PacBio sequencing. If you're familiar with PacBio sequencing, it's based on really uh, the polymerase itself uh, that's doing incorporations of, of various uh, fluorescent bases. And the PacBio really takes a, a movie of these uh, incorporation of all of these bases as the sequencing um, proceeds. And, and the very nice feature of that is that by just looking at these intervals and the time it takes to incorporate various uh, bases, if the strand, as you see down here, the strand that is being uh, sequenced uh, using the PacBio has these modification, including 5NC, well, you, you expect to observe some, some change and some shift in the time some of these incorporation takes. So this can be mined uh, to, to characterize uh, methylation status uh, of the bases at the same time as you're sequencing. Nanopore does something similar using a nanopore with, um, you know, the, the, the single strand going through the pore and the rate at which the, 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 the single strand proceeds through the nanopore defines, uh, you know, can be used to, to extract the actual base but also actually the, um, the whether the base is modified or not. And this would work with both native DNA and RNA. So you can, you know, there's already some, some software to extract the bases corresponding at the flow of that fragment through the nanopore. And, and you, you can detect more subtle signal that corresponds to, to modified versus unmodified bases. And, and this is quite exciting and it's already started to be used to profile methylation even in, in quite difficult regions of the genome that would be impossible to profile like centromere, that would be impossible to profile using arrays or, or short reads uh, for that matter. And uh, you know, the 5MC is, is actually just at the top of the iceberg in terms of what types of modification can potentially be captured uh, using these approaches. So that's the, um, that's, I guess, on the plus side, on the good side. So there's really uh, quite a lot of potential. Um, the, the challenge is, is that this is compared to, uh, this remains sort of very much in development and quite challenging because um, these modifications don't affect the polymerase. If we think about the bio sequencing, the effect is quite subtle. Uh, and such that you really need high coverage. You have to observe this many times to be able to have confidence that there is a methylation. So in this paper, they say 250X for accurate detection of 5MC. So you can imagine that you know, reaching that type of coverage using long read for a large genome is, is extremely costly. So it's, so it's lots of potential, but still lots of work to do. And similarly for nanopore, you know, it, they're already trying to resolve and improve the accuracy of the base calling itself. Uh, this just add another layer and, and without, you know, very high coverage and, and, and good base calling algorithms, according, you know, here mentioning that taking into account, in account context, you know, this is still quite, quite difficult. So because of this, the current methods really have high false positive rate. Uh, they might work well with a you know tiny genomes where you can have extremely high coverage, but otherwise it's not not so practical. So that's part of why this is I think exciting upcoming technology. But for the for the practical, we're going to be focusing on on whole genome by sulfite sequence. Um, <clears throat> maybe maybe I can I can pause here for a second just to see if there's any question. Um, I've I've basically finished the, the intro on the background, and now I'll just provide a bit of info on, on the steps for the analysis in the second part. So there's a question from Martin Wong in the Slack. Are there techniques for detecting non-CPG DNA methylation or even methylation of RNA molecules? 
Yes, absolutely. So, I mean, there's 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 a, a range of techniques. Uh, I, I have it here, right? So on the left side was the DNA modification and the RNA modification. Uh, so these are all sort of the, some of the techniques that are using the long read sequencing uh, that can characterize and profile all of these different marks. It's, uh, it's pretty crazy. Um, I, I think, so there's other techniques to detect other modification uh, using short reads. So there's some modification of um, <clears throat> of the, the bisulfite treatment and different types of uh, protocols that do allow you to characterize other types of marks, but each has its own sort of flavor to them. And again, uh, in this case, and for the tutorial, we're going to be focusing on the 5MC as, as one of the most commonly uh, looked at uh, DNA methylation mark. Thanks for the question. All right, so so moving on to uh, to the analysis now of of this data. So, uh, <clears throat> I mean, you'll see that uh, whole genome bisulfite analysis is not for the and you know the so it, yeah for it's not it's not the easiest uh, type of bioinformatic analysis, and a lot of that comes from the effect of the bisulfite treatment and how and, and what it's gonna it's gonna require. So I'll I'll, I'll show that as I, I I move through these slides. Um, but but basically, you know, we have um, sort of standard quality control. We're gonna be doing alignment. We're gonna quantify the methylation, uh, and then we'll want as we want we're doing with a chip seek to to do some visualization and statistical analysis. And at the end, very similar to what you did with ChIP-seq and looking at, um, you know, um, def uh, differentially um, <clears throat> marked regions, we'll, we'll do a, a differential methylation analysis. Um, so starting with, um, you know, and, and this applies to any bioinformatics workflow before you start the analysis, it's really important that you take a bit of time to look at your raw data. We're actually not going to do that in the, the practical for, for this particular module um, for lack of time. But but again, keep keep that in mind. Uh, very similar to what uh, you, you, you heard on ChIP-seq analysis. And I'll have a few slides on this. Um, you know, were all of your sample sequence using the same protocol and instrument? Were there any technical issues affecting some of your sample? Um, so it's really important that you look at the starting data set uh, even before you jump in more more fancy statistical analysis because this you know might affect your interpretation if you if you really uh, if there were different patches and so on. Um, so you can run fastQC um, very similar on some of these read files that you'll get from um, just to get sense of of the quality of the sequencing and, and uh, some of the, the read quality. Uh, one of the things that, that you'll notice is a bit funny if you're doing this with um, you know, bisulfite treated sequences is that the sequences that you get uh, back from the sequencers obviously have sort of slightly different um, uh, properties in terms of percentage of, of Cs and, and, and so on because of this uh, bisulfite treatment. So only, um, you know, the, the methylated Cs will have been unconverted. So that's why it shifts the proportion quite a bit. RRBS, uh, thinking about that type of data, also because of the cut, um, you know, has, has an unusual distribution uh, because it really enriches in these uh, CPG regions. Uh, but again, to some extent, it's really to, to make sure that if you're analyzing 10 samples, that these 10 samples have similar distribution and, 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 and behave as you would expect. Uh, one thing that's, that's also going to be quite important for the methylation quantification is your, your library diversity. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, if you have, depending on, on, you know, if you have a complex library, you know, all of your reads uh, really are, are going to be covering slightly different interval. Uh, if your library has a lot of a PCR and duplicated um, 
sequences, I guess. Um, so, so you might end up with uh, lots of copies of exactly the, the same read uh, following those um, amplification. And the tricky part with this is that, you know, depending on whether these are independent observation or really just the same observation, um, it's really going to affect your estimates of, of methylation of a given site. So it's quite important. Uh, so you have it here. Here you have, you know, um, two observation, but actually you're repeating this observation many times. So you're saying that this, you know, has low methylation. Well, actually, you just have two observation, and and this would be fifty percent. So, you know, removing duplicate is quite important to get accurate. Uh, methylation estimates here. Uh, and in general, having, you know, complex or diverse library uh, will, will really give you much better results and much more effective coverage. So looking at the, the duplicate rate in your library is one of the important uh, metrics. So read quality, you know, presence of any kinds of adapters in the sequencers, looking at duplicate ra rates, uh, and also conversion rate. So I didn't have that in detail in the slides, but how effective, how, how efficient was the bisulfide conversion is another uh, metric to look at and make sure that your samples are are, are similar. Um, just to give you a sense of sort of some of the, the state of uh, standards used by ENCODE, uh, ideally having two or three uh, biological replicates, um, and so the, this P to T conversion rate should be 98%. Uh, so again, this is uh, to ensure that the bisulfide conversion worked. Um, you know, between, you should have a good correlation for sites with, with significant coverage and, and so on. So um, this, again, just to give you a sense of the kinds of numbers to, to expect when you look at these QC metrics. Um, Moving on to the, the alignment. So this is where it gets really quite quite a bit of fun. Uh, so so I mentioned, so you know, typically we have a reference sequence and we're just mapping these reads to the, the reference sequence. Uh, the, the challenge we face with bisulfite treatment treated reads uh, is that the effect on the positive strand and Watson strand it will be different than on the Crick strand. And so by the time you do the alignment, uh, you will have to align to different references because you basically, um, well, I'll get to it when I talk about the alignment, but basically we take into account uh, these, these potential change in the reference uh, of C to T and, and we'll have to make these changes uh, relative to the genome on both strands, and then with the reads on both strands, so you end up basically uh, doing doing the mapping four times, um, assuming that you're on each strand, both with your read and on the reference genome, with these uh, potential change. Uh, so that adds quite a lot to the alignment step, and different algorithms will, will attack this problem in a different way. Uh, <clears throat> So there's three uh, three main strategies, and really the first two are the, the standard ones uh, for aligning the whole genome bisulfide reads to the genome. So one uh, is a wildcard alignment, and the other one is a, is a three-letter alignment, and then the reference pre-processing. So the wildcard, so one approach is to replace all the Cs in the genome with a wildcard character so that whether it's a C or a T will align to that uh, region. So you just, uh, you know, you you avoid um, the mismatch that you would be getting, whether it's methylated or not with this uh, wild card. Um, so, so there's a few tools, uh, not the one we're gonna be using today, but there's a few tools that, that use this approach. Um, another approach, uh, this is where uh, you end up doing you know, four times the mapping to some extent is that you convert all the C's into T's in both the reads and for the, the genomic sequence that you're trying to align to. 
Um, so by doing this, uh, well, I'll get to the, the advantage of disadvantages, but whether your read came from the plus trend or negative trend and whether, uh, you know, which, where it's uh, mapping to on the genomic sequence, you should be getting, you know, a good mapping uh, based on that. And the tools that use this approach and then try to reconcile the floor mapping uh, are, are this mark that we're going to be using and some other uh, tool, more recent tool like uh, GemVS. Um, so here's a quick cartoon, but again, this is um, maybe a bit uh, technical. It always takes me a bit of time to, to warm up my, my brain to this, but you know, you've got the wildcard alignment uh, that converts um, the C's and the T to these uh, to these Y um, wild cards and the CGs to to, to to wild cards versus the three letter alignment. And the the big take home on this is that you know of course by by converting all of these to wild cards, you're losing a lot of your the specificity into the mapping. Um, so you know, you end up um, mapping lots of things, including in places that don't really map to. Um, so you're losing a lot of that uh, specificity, and this will have an impact on on your estimates of DNA methylation. And so, typically, these three-letter alignment uh, methods uh, are, are are more specific, and they tend to be preferred, even though then they lose to some extent sometimes, uh, or they're less efficient and, and might lose in uh, sensitivity. Um, so some, some strengths and, and weaknesses of these two main approach, uh, three-letter aligners have lower coverage in these uh, highly methylated regions because that's right, they, they convert all the Cs, right? So in the, so for the regions that are highly methylated, you might be um, losing some reads, uh, so you're you're also, you know, they have a weakness in these uh, in these regions. Um, the wildcard liners have, you know, map more, but at the cost of of losing specificity and having some some biases because of all of these changes. So uh, a lot of these problems are especially prevalent in repetitive regions of the genome. So this goes back to what I mentioned with the long reads that ultimately will be needed to resolve some of these typical regions of the genome. But in general, you know, for most regions of the genome, these approach uh, perform quite well. Uh, so another thing, and I, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this. Uh, well, so this is the approach uh, by Bismarck uh, that, I, that we're gonna be using uh, in the practical that does this uh, four-way mapping and then determine the, the unique best alignment. Um, I mentioned briefly that there's uh, another tool that I know we, uh, we've we been using within IAC and it works well, which is called GEMBS. Uh, GEMBS has uh, you know, a nice feature of being more uh, efficient and, and taking less time um, than, than uh, Bismarck. But, um, it's you know Bismarck has really uh, been is used uh, quite a lot, and this is the one we're going to be using in the practical. And we've just simply downsampled the samples such that we could process them um, during uh, during the time that we have in the practical. Um, I'm uh, just I'm going quickly over this uh, because we're we're running out of time, and I want to have a bit of time for questions if if any. Uh, but again, you're going to be in the practical. We'll also have more time to talk about this. I just wanted to mention briefly that there's a third approach, which is called reference-free processing, that you know might also be uh, in some of these difficult regions uh, something to explore. Uh, although you know I, I haven't seen a lot of recent results pushing in this direction, but there's a concept of reference-based variant detection. So this is now thinking about just variance, not just methylation, but this general idea that you map to a reference and then you look for a mismatch. And this is how we're going to be looking for, uh, you know, methylation on the cytosines. Uh, but just like when we do uh, this type of variant detection, you can also think of ways of doing this, but just using, 
the equivalent of gamers and 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 you know basically doing the same type of approach but without using a reference and just comparing reads uh, from from two sets from tumor and normal without having a reference and then looking for variants. So similarly, and this was a tool again, but I haven't seen this used that much, but exploring whether um, this the same kind of strategy could be used to do methylation analysis. Um, so this is all about the alignment. Um, moving on now to actually estimating and quantifying absolute uh, DNA methylation itself. So we'll do a bit like what was shown in the cartoon where I showed you the duplicate uh, uh, reads where after the alignment uh, onto the genome, we'll be able to you know, can count basically the unconverted versus converted cytosine by just looking at these, um, these T's uh, instead of G's and so on. So we'll just at, at each position and then from this, we can estimate um, the methylation percentage. Um, one, one, so if you didn't think that bisulfite alignment wasn't complicated enough, one thing that I haven't talked about yet is the fact that the, the SNPs are actually adding another layer of complexity in all of this because, um, you know, we assume that the reference is the same for everybody. Obviously, it's not. If you have SNPs, this Com further complicates this conversion of the reference and the mapping of the reads and the estimates that you get out of the, the whole genome bisulfite sequencing. So there are some tools that are out there that are that do both the SNP and the variant calling at the same time as as the as the you know conversion and mismatch coming from methylation counting. But you know again unless you have very high read coverage uh, this this can be quite challenging. <clears throat> so an alternative to this is sometimes to, uh, you know, sort of ignore the SNPs to some extent at the alignment step and then map them, mask them, I'm sorry, uh, from the results in the quantification of, of, uh, of methylation. Because again, the, the quality of the estimates over these, these variants will be, uh, will be lower. Um, so some of the, the tools uh, that can be used uh, for this, uh, both doing the SNP and the methylation calling are, are listed here, but this is also not something we're gonna be covering in detail in the practical. Um, okay, um, moving on a little bit to, okay, we've aligned our reads, we've quantified uh, the methylation status, um, you know, we'll want to look at the data and make sure that things behave as we would expect. Um, one of the very nice thing with uh, IVV, which you're familiar with, and is that it has a methylation specific um, mode, where again these these mismatch that correspond to to methylated Cs can be highlighted in, in different colors. So this is one of the things that we're going to be playing with in the practical. But you can basically look at, uh, you know, instead of looking at mismatch or, uh, so you've got a general coverage, and then what you're showing are these methylation status uh, to the point where you can get, uh, you know, regions that are differentially methylated in, in two ten, uh, in sets of, uh, of sample corresponding to uh, the kind of cartoon examples that I showed you at the very beginning. So again, that's the kind of stuff we're going to be doing in the practical. Uh, you want to look at some of the regions in the genome. You also want to look at sort of global distribution of methylation values and start doing some clustering of samples and so on. So that's exactly what we're going to be doing in the practical. Uh, you know, you expect and, you know, the percentage of CPGs to be either highly methylated in a subset of cases or unmethylated uh, for, for the majority of, of the genome. Um, and, and you also want to look at the coverage um, to see whether you had good and uniform coverage and whether your, your estimates are, are reasonable or not. Uh, you know, whether your estimates are reasonable or not, you're going to see that from 
uh, if you have replicates and if you have different conditions and so on uh, through these uh, correlation analysis. And again, uh, this is the kind of stuff that we're going to be doing in the practical, just comparing the values that we're getting across uh, different cell types and, and replicates. Um, so examples and the kind of clustering you can do with metal kit, which is um, the tool we're going to use uh, in, in the practical. Um, so I, I'm coming uh, to the end, maybe just another five minutes, and then we can take a few questions if there are any. Um, so once you've you've identified, uh, you know, we, 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 we've looked at some of these general properties, the samples behave the way you expect. Uh, we might want to start really going, as we did with ChIP-seq, uh, identifying regions that are uh, differentially methylated or, and, and, and so on, and do a global analysis of these. Um, so here's uh, a cartoon from a review that somehow I'm not citing here that I, I like a lot. Um, so it, it highlights, I think, some of these examples, well, you know, the, the advantage that you know, we talked at the very beginning about sort of enrichment approach versus single base pair resolution approach. Uh, if we're doing whole genome bisulfite sequencing, we really have uh, ideally base pair resolution of of the methylation level of of, C, uh, of CPGs. Uh, if you have a nice uh, study with cases and controls, whether it's tumor or cancel or tumor and normal or, or or whatever, so you can see the level of individual uh, CPG differences in methylation status. Uh, you can do single CPG analysis to identify the ones that are significant uh, in cases and control. But you can also move to more region analysis and, and either having tiling regions or having a way to, uh, to identify regions with uh, significant signal. And this, in some case, might be even more uh, significant. Uh, and then you can associate that with with regions of the genome, like enhancers and so on. Um, obviously, like like in any of these types of experiments, it's good to have replicates. Um, you might have one one sample that behave uh, a bit different or quite different if you look at the two pink sample, and it's not clear that the average here is very really representative. Um, so having replicates will will help you, uh, you know, understand really the, the confidence in your in your signal. Uh, there's also in the context of methylation, you know, the signal sometimes can be a bit noisy at the individual CPGs. Um, so in some case, you want to actually do some some smoothing pre prior to identifying uh, some of the regions of interest, allowing you to remove. You might have undetected, uncharacterized SNPs that are leading to CPGs misbehaving or or the alignment, as I mentioned, is quite challenging. So you might be losing uh, some regions because of that. Uh, so anyway, so some smoothing might help uh, resolve this. So um, <clears throat> one of the tools that you're going to be using in the practical uh, to do this and to try to identify these regions that uh, act as DMR is this tool called DSS, uh, which which you know can be used to to identify these regions that are really in these uh, two sample here behave different uh, from from these two. Um, all right, uh, I think this is my final slide um, for for this. Um, it's 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 just uh, I, I like this uh, figure as well because especially if you focus on the right side, it shows that there's a trade-off. Uh, depending on how much you sequence. So depending on whether you have very shallow sequencing in gray or very deep sequencing, such that you're covering with your bisulfide treated reads between 10 and, and 30x, well, if you have very low sequencing, you might be able to detect very big region uh, and that have very big methylation differences. But you're probably not going to be able to do very good job at single resolution uh, CPG characterization. But as you sequence more, and if you reach 10X and more of the genome, then, then you're gonna start being able to characterize 
methylation much more precisely in terms of smaller regions and smaller uh, methylation differences. But it's always a bit of trade-off depending on how much you, you sequence. Um, um, <clears throat> okay, so some, some conclusion. Uh, you know, bisulfite sequencing analysis is not easy, to be honest, especially these issues about uh, the reference genome, uh, the SNPs, you know, those are not, not trivial, and they're actually not trivial on the software side of things either. Uh, it's really, you know, having four bases of the genome uh, makes the mapping much more unique. If you, if you think about the fact that we're now um, sort of removing a bit of that by converting some of the bases, we're working more in something that looks like a three base pair uh, bases genome. And that really makes some of these mappability issues bigger. Um, I talked quite a bit about the different choices of methylation technologies, um, you know, some of the, the quality check and the biases. Um, yeah. But uh, but maybe I'll I'll stop here and we have just a few minutes. But uh, but I'll be oh I had one more slide I guess that I didn't show but that was only to talk about and David will talk about this much more tomorrow about uh, you know some examples of available whole genome bisulfite data sets that you might have. But um, maybe I can stop here and see if there's any questions on all of this.